All right. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Howard Hennett, as Ian's already said. And I'd like to start off with just how happy I am to be here. Oh, thank you very much. That will come in handy. I, I'm very honored to be here. And um, this morning, I'm going to be talking about one of my pet projects, really. I've been working on Chrono for, well, forever. <laughs> and um, today, I want to talk about Chrono, both at the C++11 level, and there's a whole new raft of features coming in C++20. And not only do I want to tell you about those features, but I also want to explain a little bit why some of the design decisions were made uh, to do certain things the way that they've been done. And maybe, just maybe, uh, you can apply some of that rationale to the code that you're writing. So to start off with, I'm just going to go through and, and talk a little bit about what C++, uh, I mean, what Chrono is and what was introduced in C++11. This won't be a detailed uh, tutorial on Chrono, of course. That's a whole hour talk in itself. But at the heart of the Chrono library, there's durations. And duration is just a period of time, like three minutes or three hours or what have you. And Chrono introduced six durations that you see here on the screen. And of course, clients can also uh, program their own custom duration types. And I'll get into that a little bit later. But everything in Chrono stands upon durations. And the first thing that stands upon durations is the time point. A time point is different from a time duration. A time point is like uh, today at 3 o'clock as opposed to 3 minutes. It specifies a point in time. And also in C++11, we had clocks. And clocks are very simple objects. There's just a bundle of a uh, time point and a duration and a static function that gets the current time called now. Very simple. In C++20, we're adding calendrical types. We're adding time zone management. We're adding more clocks, of course. And we're adding a ton of formatting and parsing capability. I find that uh, that's the, the thing that people most want to do with Chrono is format and parse it. And that's really missing from C++11. So with C++20, Chrono really becomes a complete time handling library. You should never, ever have to use the C-Timing API again. At least that's my personal goal. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> However, everybody is not going to adopt C++20 Chrono the first day out. So you will have to talk to other parts of your, library, uh, of your application or other libraries that are still using the C-Timing API. And trust me, that's still possible with, with C++20 Chrono. So everything I talk about today, whether it's old types from C++11 or new types in C++20, it will have a streaming operator. This makes Chrono so much easier to use and understand. Uh, for example, by far the most uh, frequent use of Chrono is just to time a little bit of piece of code. And you call now once at the beginning of your code and now again at the end of it. You subtract the two and you get a time duration. And in C++11, you're not quite done. You know, you have to say, OK, I, I don't know what units that time duration is. So I need to cast it to some known units like milliseconds or seconds or microseconds, whatever you need. And you're still not done. You have to then call the dot count member function on that. And you finally get an integer that you can print out. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you probably need to print out the units as well. And as C++20, you just subtract your two time points, and you can stream that out directly. It'll print out the value and the units. And so suddenly, Chrono becomes just immensely easier to use. So a little bit more detail about duration. It's a templated class, which is one of the things that people really hate about it, at least at first. Um, but uh, the templated class is kind of like uh, basic string is to string. A lot of times you can just use Chrono and you don't have to worry that it's a templated class. You just use string, with, you know, or seconds, or milliseconds. But I want to tell you a little bit more detail about what duration is. Under the hood, it's templated on rep, which is the, rep uh, the representation. The representation could be an int, it could be a long long, could even be a double, can even be a user-defined class that's emulating one of those types. And 
It's also composed of a period, which is the number of ticks between two integral values of your representation. If your uh, period is a compile time fraction of one over one, that means your duration is representing seconds. If the period is one half, that means there's one half of a second between two integral values of your representation. And Chrono defines several uh, convenience type aliases, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, the first six were introduced in C++ 11 hours through nanoseconds. C++ 20 is going to add days, weeks, months, and years, which of course is going to make it much, much easier for Chrono to interface with calendrical objects. And clients can define any custom unit they want. Uh, the top one here, DSEC, this is just an uh, a example of when somebody would want to make a floating point version of seconds. And that's uh, very nice for timing if you want to time a piece of code and get your, get your time out in seconds, you know, 2.33 seconds, whatever. The second example is an a example where maybe you're a gaming uh, person and you want to model uh, one frame of your, of your application. You might introduce something called frame rate, which models 1 60th of a second, represented by a single int. Or you might uh, say, wow, I'm really worried about overflow, and I've got this safe int library over here that somebody else wrote, and I want Chrono to use this safe int library so that it throws us an exception anytime it detects overflow. You can pop that right into duration and use any, uh, any period you want, the example here is nano, and nano is nothing but a type alias or a type def for a ratio of one over a billion. So Chrono is very, very flexible, and this is an example of the very lowest level that you can access the Chrono library. Uh, Chrono has both very low level access and very high level access. And at the low level, you can do fancy things like make crust, uh, custom duration types. So the next thing you need to know about Chrono is that it does all the conversions for you. There's been a ton of code I've seen where they say, oh, I'm going to be modern. I'm going to use the Chrono library. And then they divide by a 1,000 or multiply by a million right there in their code. And that's a little frustrating because Chrono lives and dies to do those conversions for you. You should never have raw conversion factors in your code because if you do, Eventually, you're going to miss a zero somewhere, or you're going to multiply where you should have divided, or something like that. You're going to introduce errors. On the other hand, if you let Chrono do all your conversions for you, it's always going to be right, and it's always going to be more readable, which is maybe even more important. So here I'm showing how you do conversions in, in Chrono, and you simply assign one type to the other. Now, there is a caveat. This only works for when you're converting coarse units to fine units. Here in this example, I'm converting hours to milliseconds. So it's an implicit conversion, and it just happens, and the result is you get 7.2 million milliseconds when you do this conversion inside of X. The reason it happens implicitly is because it's a lossless conversion. The conversion is always exact, and so it's, it's always correct, and it introduces no error. Now, when you go the other way, that's not quite true. If you have a number of milliseconds, there's no guarantee that if you convert that to hours, that the hours is going to exactly represent the number of milliseconds. So Chrono says, truncation error. You can do this, but I'm not going to let you do it implicitly. Why? Because truncation error is sometimes associated with a, a logic error in your application. So there, but sometimes you do have to do it, and so there's a named conversion called duration cast, and you just put the des destination unit, hours in this example, in the angle brackets, and it'll do the conversion for you. The, the theme here is Chrono is doing its best to find all your errors at compile time. And truncation error, although it's something you do have to do in real world code, is more dangerous than a, a lossless conversion. So the idea here, idea here is every time you need to use uh, truncation error, use duration cast. And then if later on you're trying to debug your code and you're, you suspect that truncation error may be the cause, it's much easier to search for your duration cast to inspect everywhere you're using truncation conversions, truncating conversions. 
Now, I also mentioned that um, you can use floating point uh, based durations. Here, I'm, I've got a, a double based second. And when the destination of your conversion is a double based duration type, then the conversion can happen implicitly again. The reason is there's no truncation error. If you have 1,500 milliseconds, it'll convert to 1.5 seconds. And it'll, the, the double will hold whatever precision a double holds. So there may be round off error, but there's no truncation error, and that's the rationale for why that conversion can be made implicitly. Next, time point. Time point represents a point in time, uh, tomorrow, today at 3 p.m., what have you. And all it is is a simple wrapper around a duration. You can have the exact same value and the exact same representation if you looked in a debugger between a time point and a duration. They just have very different semantics. <clears throat> time points also offer only a subset of the algebra so as to catch logic errors at compile time. For example, let's say you've got two time points from system clock now. You can subtract them, and that doesn't give you another uh, time point. That gives you a time duration between those two time points. And that's perfectly fine. That's great. That's how you're supposed to use chrono. But let's say you uh, made a typo, and you accidentally added two time points. Well, that's just nonsensical. Uh, tomorrow minus today is valid. That's two time points uh, resulting in a duration of a day. But if you said tomorrow plus today, what does that even mean? Well, it's a logic error. So Chrono finds that logic error at compile time, won't, it won't let it, you compile it, and so that you can debug your code much easier. This is going to be a recurring theme uh, that I'm probably going to be saying over and over again. Find the error at compile time. Compile time errors are so much cheaper and easier to debug than runtime errors. So Chrono goes out of its way to find all the errors it can or can even anticipate at compile time instead of letting you do it and then cause a runtime error. Time point is uh, templated on duration, of course, so that it can have uh, any precision you want. Time points can have uh, nanosecond precision, seconds precision, what have you. But time points are also templated on the clock that it's measuring time from. And this is another example of trying to find your errors at compile time. Let's say now we've got two time points, but one comes from system clock and one comes from steady clock. Well, these are two completely different unrelated clocks. Every clock counts time since some epoch, but two different clocks are not necessarily counting time from the same epochs. So if you subtracted them in Chrono, if Chrono allowed this to happen, you would get garbage out, a runtime error. So Chrono is set up to say, if you subtract two time points, and those two time points are based on different clocks, it's a compile time error. It's time to go fix your code. So that was your review of C++ 11 Chrono, and I'd like to start getting into the new stuff now. And I'm going to start with a philosophical question, and that is, what is the difference between a time point and a date? And of course, since I've got to take this philosophical question and eventually code it in a library, I'm approaching it as a programmer. So it'll quickly turn from philosophy into code. But here are several time points, and they're of varying precision. The first one's seconds precision, then microseconds, and so on, down to nanoseconds. And my point here is that time points can have arbitrarily fine precision, and they're all still time points. Conversely, you can also start getting coarser and coarser time points. Uh, the last two time points have precision minutes and precision hours. They're all still time points. <clears throat> time points can even have a precision of an entire day. And when a time point has a precision of an entire day, we call that a date. Now, it's not actually called date in the library, but as humans, we call a time point with a precision of a day a date. And this was actually a, a fundamental realization in building the C++ 20 calendrical services. Now, all of these time points in Chrono have explicit types. And these types are time point, and the first template parameter is system clock, and the second par parameter 
is a duration that specifies whatever precision that time point has to have. And all of these types are actually in C++11. Uh, the last one down there at the bottom of the screen on the, on the right has a precision days, and that unit isn't actually in C++11. But it's a very simple type def. You could make days in C++11 yourself just by saying days equals duration, whatever representation, int, and a ratio of 86,400 seconds. It's one short line of code. So it's not really, days isn't new in C++20, just the name days is new in C++20. Now we use these time points so much in C++20 that I gave them a simpler name, SysTime. SysTime is just a type alias for the family of time points that are templated on system clock. And you can still make SysDays of any duration you want. And this is going to be another recurring theme. You're going to see similar type aliases later on in the talk. And that's, uh, that's another thing that I'd like to express that the API of Chrono is admittedly huge, but the, the ideas are repeated over and over again so that the, the apparent API of Chrono is a lot smaller than the physical API. You just learn a few patterns, and pretty soon you're, you've learned the whole library. Now, there is one further simplification that C++20 makes here. Two of these type defs are used so often, or type aliases, that they have even simpler names, the first one and the last one. Six sys seconds is just a time point based on system clock with a precision of seconds, and sys days, <coughs> excuse me, is just a time point based on system clock with a precision of days. And the reason sys days is used so often is it's a key tool in interoperating with calendrical systems. So, speaking of calendrical systems. Now let's talk about, kind of philosophically, what is a calendar? A calendar is just a collection of dates. And remember, a date is just a day precision time point. And a calendar gives each of those dates a unique name. And that's all a calendar is, really. And different calendars can have different names for the exact same physical dates. Here I'm listing some dates close to January 1st, 1970. If you look at them in a different calendar, say the Julian calendar, the Julian calendar has names for those same physical dates, but they're just different names. And Sysdays is a calendar too. Under the hood, Sysdays is just a, a number, 45 or zero or negative two. But those are the names for specific dates, and these are the sys days names for these civil calendar dates. And it's kind of important for the user of Chrono to understand that under the hood, this is all that's happening. And the reason it's important for the user to understand this is because it's very simple what's happening under the hood. Just like when you use a, uh, a container like Vector. Vector is not this mysterious collection of objects we all know it's just a linear array under the hood. We don't need to know the details. But it's important to know the difference between a vector and a, and a list, which is a doubly linked list under the hood. Under the hood, sysdays is just a, a very simple number. And it is a calendar that names dates. So you could say, and you'd be accurate, that sysdays is the canonical calendar in Chrono. And you can have multiple other calendars. And as long as every calendar converts to and from that canonical calendar, then every calendar can be converted to any other calendar, whether it's user written or supplied by Chrono. Now this slide is a little bit misleading. I want to uh, assure you that Chrono is not supplying all of these calendars. On Chrono only supplies the civil calendar and sys days, but the user can write any of these other calendars that they want to, and that calendar will be a first-class system in the Chrono library. The civil calendar has no benefits just from, aside from being a namespace standard Chrono. And in fact, I've, I've personally written uh, not all of these, but several of these, just to prove the concept and just to make sure that I'm not lying to you here this morning. 
So with that in mind, let's take a look at what the civil calendar in standard chrono actually, actually looks like. I'm going to start with this class called Year Month Day. And I'm going to tell you right up front what's under the hood. Because like the containers, I think it's important for you to understand when you're using these calendrical types, what is under the hood. And what is under the hood of this thing is just three fields, the year, the month, and the day. It's a very, very simple class. You can construct one of these with a year and a month and a day. And in the next slide, I'll go into exactly how to construct years, months, and days. And there's no, there's no loss of, uh, I'm sorry, um, and when you construct one of these with a year, month, and a day, absolutely no computation is done. All it does is store the year, month, and day. So naturally, it's very fast when it does this. And it has year, month, and day getters. So if you have one and you want to find out what the year, month, and day are, you just get the year, get the day, and get the month. It's all very simple. And year, month, and day converts to and from sys days with no loss of information whatsoever. And that's what makes year, month, day a calendar. Just the fact that it converts to and from sys days. Remember that the previous slide. This makes it a calendar. So it's a quality and less than comparable. You can do year and month oriented arithmetic uh, on it. For example, adding or subtracting a number of years or adding some, or subtracting a number of months. One thing that surprises people when they first come across this library though, is it doesn't do day oriented arithmetic. If I have a year month day and I add or subtract a number of days to it, you get a compile time error. There's a reason for that. It's not that I forgot to supply day oriented arithmetic. And in fact, it would be very easy for me to supply, or the Chrono Library to supply day-oriented arithmetic on it. And if I did so, the recipe for doing that is to take the year, month, day, convert it to sys days, then do your day-oriented arithmetic on that. Why? Because day-oriented arithmetic on sys days is very, very efficient. Remember, recall that sys days is just a count of days under the hood, so you just add or subtract the number of days, whatever value sys days has, and then you can take that sys days and you convert it back to year, month, day. Now the conversions from year, month, day to sys days and sys days to year, month, day are not horribly expensive, but relative to one addition or one subtraction, they're a little bit expensive. There may be uh, a dozen or so multiplications and divisions uh, taking place when you convert from sys days to year, month, day or vice versa. And the philosophy here is that we don't want to hide those relatively expensive operations under the hood. Vector doesn't have a push, back, a push front. Why? It's a little bit expensive. You can still push front onto a vector using other syntax. It's called insert. But when you read insert in your code, you kind of get a feeling for what's going on. You know that uh, it's not, probably not going to be an order one operation. Uh, another example, list, the doubly linked list. It would be trivial to put an index operator on, on list. You would just, you know, take the number out of your, your index, you take your index, iterate that many times from begin, and you could return the answer. But if we had index operator on list, you would start seeing code that looked like for i equals zero to n index the list. And such a loop is order n squared. You would be inviting your client to write inefficient code. So the, the philosophy is the same here. I don't want to hide expensive operations under the hood. I want, when you read the client code, I want you to visibly see, oh, there's a conversion being made here. So that you note where the expensive parts are. And if you later want to try to optimize your code, you know that those are the parts that you try to minimize. So, what's a year? I don't want anything to be too mysterious here because everything is quite simple. Year is a very simple class. It stores a short signed integer under the hood that just represents the year, such as 2019. And um, one can subtract two year instances and get a duration, but year is not a duration type itself. It's more like a time point a very coarse one in that, but it's not actually a, time, a chrono time point. It's just like one. I call it a, a partial calendrical type. 
So you can explicitly convert to and from years with an int. And uh, years are equality and less than comparable. You can do year-oriented arithmetic with it. And it has a user-defined literal, lowercase y, so that in your code, you really don't even have to memorize the fact that there's a class out there named year. You can just say 2019y, and that constructs a literal type of year with the value 2019 in it. It's a very simple class. It's not complicated at all. There's no magic going on under the hood here. There's another class just like it for month, and it's the same story. So you can think of Chrono a little bit like a set of Legos or Tinker Toys. You, you've got all these different types of little building blocks, and we're going to put them together, and this, the synergy of all these different simple building blocks is going to eventually build something that's really quite inter interesting and impressive. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, I'll convince you that what I just said is correct. And if not, well, I'll, I'll try again next year. Uh, so month, it's just holding uh, a short integer inside, usually has values 1 through 12. You can subtract them, get a month's duration. It's a quality and less than comparable. Do day-oriented arithmetic on it. The only possibly surprising thing is there's no user-defined literal. And the reason there's no user-defined user literal is because it has these inline constants, January, February, March, etc. Now, if you don't like using those inline constants, that's fine too. You can still construct your, your month from explicitly from, from an int or an unsigned. And similarly for day, um, it's, it holds a small integer value. You can subtract them and get days. It's quality and less than comparable. You can do day-oriented arithmetic with it. And it has a, a user-defined literal. For example, today is 14D. Very simple classes. So getting back to year, month, day, as you noticed, each one of those small pieces held a relatively small, limited range integer. And that's because when we get up to the year, month, day, we still want this thing to be relatively small. The standard doesn't mandate that it has a size of four bytes, but the standard encourages it and certainly allows it. And when vendors come to me and for advice on how to implement this, I'm going to tell them, Make your year, month, day have a size of four bytes, even on a 64-bit machine. And the, the background on that is all this calendrical stuff wasn't made out of whole cloth by just me just sitting at home one night thinking, huh, I wonder how I should do this. I'm building on decades of experience from other libraries, such as Boost State Time. Uh, Jeff Garland has uh, done an amazing job with that, and I'm standing on his shoulders and he has told me time and time again, yes, users really do care about the size of their dates, not because it's going to take up an extra few bytes on the stack, but because they're going to have vectors of these things. And they want those vectors to not take up half their memory. So size of matters, and size of four bytes is enough to get a very nice range on dates without uh, having a size of that's overly large. With just four bytes, we can represent every single day for plus or minus 32,000 years which is more than enough because the, the civil calendar itself is not that accurate. So it's constructible with conventional syntax operators in three different orders. By conventional syntax operator, I mean the slash or the division operator. So each of these creates a year, month, day, use it with the same value and the same performance cost. You can use year, month, day ordering, month, day, year ordering, or day, month, year ordering. If you try it in any other order, it's a compile time error. Why did I choose these three orders? Because these are the most often used three orders, three different orders used on planet Earth. Um, and also, note that each of these three orders starts with a, a different type. So once you specify the first type in one of these three orders, the second and third types can be implied. If you start with year, the second and third types are always month and day in that order. So you can make this even a little bit more concise and use integers for your following two fields as long as your first field is strongly typed in any of the three orders. 
Now, I have to be honest with you. A lot of people, when they first see this, they really hate it. <laughs> I understand. I've work, been working with it for, for several years, and I like it a lot. And you may or may not come to like it. If you don't like it, do not worry. I'm not here to tell you what's readable in your code. I'm here to offer you options. So if you prefer a traditional constructor syntax, knock yourself out. That it's, it's not going to gain you any performance, but it might gain you readability in your eyes or your client's eyes, and there's nothing wrong with that. So every time I show you fancy operator syntax, know that there's a constructor like this just waiting for you to use it. Now, one thing I do want to say about this constructor is that it remains type safe. The first parameter has to be of type year. You could say year braces 2019, or you could say 2019Y. That would be fine, too. You can say month braces, curly braces 11, or just say November. And you could use 14D or day of curly braces 14 here. It doesn't matter. The one thing you cannot do is this. If you try to pass just simple untyped integers to your month day object, it won't compile. And the reason is, when you read this, it might be ambigu ambigu ambiguous in the code. For example, let's say that we had a constructor that took three ints, and let's say it wasn't marked explicit, and you were calling some function that took a year month day in, in, its, in its parameter list. Well, a legal way of calling that would be open curly breaks uh, 10, 11, 12, close curly brace. And so in that code, in that hypothetical scenario, you might look at that and wonder, what in the world does 10, 11, 12 stand for? There's no year, month, day name in that code. Um, and so that would be ambiguous. And even if you did know that that triple was forming a date, it would be ambiguous which ordering was being used. Because I hear that day, month, year ordering is very popular in some parts of the world. So this isn't allowed because, and the rationale that it's not allowed is because it makes the client code when you read it ambiguous. Now invalid dates are allowed, but they're easily detectable. So now that you know that you, that you can construct a year, month, day with you know, pretty much anything, what happens? when you construct a date such as November 31st, 2019? Does it throw an error? Does it throw an exception? No. Does it set error? No. No. Does it log an error? No. It's not an error. It might be an error in your code, and if it is an error in your code, there's a way to deal with that, and that's perfectly fine. But the Chrono library isn't going to force the fact on you that this is an error in your code. And to help with that, Year, month, day, and not only year, month, day, but year, month, and day, and every other calendrical type that I mentioned this morning has a member function called OK. And it's constant, it's no accept, and all it does is check the value in the calendrical type and return true if it's valid and in range and false if it's not. So if you uh, had such a, a value and you called OK on it, you can be assured that it's going to return false. And as I said, the rationale for this is that invalid dates are not necessarily errors. And I'm going to, in a few slides, I'll show you an example of computation that you may well want to do where the invalid date is not an error at all, it's just an intermediate result. Before I do that, I need to introduce one other type. By the way, there's going to be tons of calendrical types in the C20 library. Try not to get overwhelmed by them, because if you use the conventional syntax of forming these, most of the time you don't even know what, have to know what the names of these types are. You just kind of have to know that they exist and kind of what their behavior is. And that's not too difficult, because their behavior is very similar to the other type that you already learned. So year, month, day, last holds a year and a month under the hood, and it represents the last day of the month. It's as simple as that. It's constructible from a year and a month. It's implicitly convertible to sysdays, but not from sysdays. Why? Because not every sysdays is the last day of a month. And as year, month, year and month getters, it also has a day getter. Even though there's not a day under the hood, 
It has a day getter. There's a reason for that. Computing the, the last day of a year month pair happens to be a very efficient operation. And so it's just computed on demand. If that happened to be an expensive operation, it wouldn't be offered. There would be some other way to do it, and it would be more obvious in the code that you're doing something a little bit expensive. So it's a quality and less than comparable, does year and month oriented arithmetic, doesn't do day oriented arithmetic. Why? One thing, it would be expensive, and two things, if you add a day to a year month day last, what type is that? Can't be another year month day last, that's for sure. So uh, it's constructible with conventional syntax operators using this constant named last. I mentioned that you don't have to memorize the name of the class, year, month, day, last. And this is why. You can say last slash November slash 2019, and this forms a type of year, month, day, last in it with the values November and 2019 in it. The pattern here is you can specify a year, month, day, last in any of the three orderings, year, month, day, month, day, year, day, month, year. And anywhere you would normally have a day specifier if you were constructing a year, month, day, if you just sub in this constant last, then the type magically changes to year, month, day, last. So constructing a year, month, day, last is very easy because it follows the exact same patterns that year, month, day follows. And it's also implicitly convertible to a year, month, day. The reason is, I actually kind of already told you, it's very efficient to compute the last day of a month, uh, the, the last day of the month from a, a year, month, day last. Once you have the year, the month, and the last day, it's very efficient to, to create or convert to a year, month, day last. So this is an incredibly efficient operation. And so it's, it's offered as an implicit conversion. Now, I told you about year, month, day, last because I want to go back to the example of doing year and month arithmetic on a year, month, day. And all calendrical libraries have to deal with this issue. You've got a date or a year, month, day, such as October 31st, 2019, and you add a month to it. What happens? Well, different libraries have different ways of handling this. Uh, the Boost library says, oh, you must have meant the last day of, of November, <coughs> excuse me, November as your result. I'll just snap your result back to the last day of November. And that's a, that's a good way of doing things. There's nothing at all wrong with that. But it's not universal. Another library, such as the Bloomberg Datetime Library, will say, well, there is no November 31st, so we'll just roll that date over into December and line it up with December 1st. And that is also a perfectly valid way to do it. That's also the way that dates are uh, normalized in the C library. They're both good ways of doing it. What does this library do? Well, kind of neither and both. It puts the decision on you on how to handle this type of situation. I'm not going to pretend to know that I know best for what's good for your application. That's your job. What well, my job is to make it easy for you to do whatever it is you need to do in your date and time handling code. So I mentioned earlier this OK method. You can just do the arithmetic, and then you can ask, did I create a valid date? And in case I didn't, I'm just going to extract the year and the month, 2019 in November uh, in this example, and append last to it. Because the only thing that can go wrong, assuming you started with a valid date, is to overflow the day field. That's the only thing that can go wrong. So now I create a year, month, day, last object that represents the last day of November 2019. And I simply assign that back to a year, month, day object. It's a very fast, implicit conversion. And now I've transformed the invalid date, 31st of November, into the valid date, November 30th. So snapping to the end of the month is just two lines of code. The check and the transformation. Now, if you want to do it the, uh, the other way, overflowing into December, that actually turns out to be even easier. You just take the invalid date and convert it to sysdays. Now, sysdays is just a bunch of numbers under the hood. 
there are no invalid cystates. So this will just naturally overflow. The, the conversion algorithm doesn't have to take anything special into account for this to happen. It just naturally happens. And then when you convert cyst days back to your month day, of course, you're getting December 1st instead of November 31st. So the choice is up to you, and it's not up to me. You get to decide how to handle invalid dates in your code. Sometimes they should be an error. And when they are, you get to decide whether you're going to assert or throw an exception. Sometimes it's going to be an intermediate result, such as in this case. Sometimes it'll be a result that your application can just ignore and say, oh, these are not the dates I'm looking for, and continue in your search. Next, your month weekday. A lot of the times you need a, a date of the form. This is the second Thursday of November in 2019 which happens to be today. So this is another very common way to talk about the civil calendar. And it's constructible with conventional syntax. Anywhere you can put a day specifier in your year, month, day, or day, month, year, or month, day, year ordering, anywhere you can, uh, you can replace that day specifier with what I call an indexed weekday. And that's just a weekday using the index with a number one through five, to mean the first through fifth weekdays of that month. Your month weekday implicitly converts to and from sys days with no loss of information. By the way, you can even do this at compile time and it never throws an exception. Now note that because it converts to and from sys days, this is actually a complete separate independent calendar in the Chrono system. This is actually proof that you can write a user-defined calendar, and all, as long as you just convert to and from sys days, it's going to work just as well as this chrono-supplied calendar year month, year month weekday. So um, it's actually a fairly simple class. When you construct a year month weekday from a year month weekday in an index, all it does is store those bits of information. No computation whatsoever is done until you ask for computation, such as converting it to sys days. It's a quality comparable, but it's not less than comparable. There's a good reason why it's not less than comparable. If, you've, uh, if you're talking about the, the first Tuesday of a month and the first Wednesday of the month is one less than the other, you can find out but to find out, the best way to, to do it is to convert both of those values to sys days and then do the comparison, because it could go either way depending on what the first day of the month is. So since that's a relatively expensive operation, Chrono says, I'm going to let you do that so that you know exactly what you're doing, and there's not some magic going under the hood that's going to make this a really wicked fast operation. And of course, you can do year and month oriented arithmetic on it, just like you can with year month day. And um, it will explicitly convert to year month day by bouncing off sys days under the hood. Remember the slide with all the calendars and all the arrows going every which way? Year month day, year month weekday is just another one of those calendars that can convert to any other calendar by bouncing off sys days under the hood, whether it's year month day or whether it's a calendar you write. So diving down a little bit, because I, I want to assure you that your month weekday is a very simple class because it's made up of even simpler little Lego building blocks. There's a class called weekday. It stores a number one through, well, zero through seven, so to speak. It explicitly converts to and from unsigned. Um, it's explicitly constructible from sys days, but not the other way around. The reason for that is, again, efficiency. Let's say you just had some year month day object and you wanted to find which weekday it was. The most efficient way to do that is to, to convert the year month day object to sys days and then the sys days to a weekday. It's just the way the calendrical algorithms work out. And that's reflected here. So that's why weekday is constructible from a sys days because that's the most efficient way to find out what, what weekday it is. It's a quality comparable, but it's not less than comparable. And the reason for that is there's considerable 
debate about what's the first day of the week? And there's multiple answers. And the Chrono Library is not going to give you an answer. The Chrono Library doesn't care which is the first day of the week. When you construct these, uh, this from an integer, it will accept either the C encoding, which is 0 through 6 represents Sunday through Saturday, or it'll accept the ISO encoding 1 through 7, which is Monday through Sunday, is represented by 1 through 7. Um, it tries to stay completely agnostic as to the question is, which is the first day of the week? And there's a good reason for staying agnostic. Well, one, of course, the obvious one is, I don't want hate mail. Uh, the, the next obvious one is, if it did assume the first day of the week, that would be an ambiguity in your client's code. And Kronos strives to not make the client write ambiguous code. So if it were less than comparable, that would, Im that would imply a first day, first day of the week. Is Sunday less than or less than, uh, less than or greater than Monday? Chrono's not going to answer that question for you. Uh, if you ask it, it's a compiled time error. It'll do day-oriented arithmetic, but modulo 7. That is, Monday minus Sunday is one day, and Sunday minus Monday is six days. You can subtract any weekday from any other weekday, and you're always going to get a number of days in the range 0 to 6. And it does not have user-defined literal because it has these const x per named constants Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but you can use uh, an integer to construct one, choose your encoding as long as it's ISO or C, and away you go. Now, weekday indexed, excuse me, is just all this plus a small index. And that index normally is in the range 1 to 5, which means you're asking about or referring to the first through the fifth weekday of a month. And if you construct it this way, you don't have to remember this kind of obscure name weekday indexed. You can just take a weekday, whether it's a constant or a variable, index it, and you've constructed one of these classes. But if you really hate this syntax, I understand. Use weekday indexed, and there's a constructor that takes a weekday and, a, and an index. And there's something else here. And the reason I'm introducing this, I'm not going to introduce every type in Chrono because we'd be here all week. But uh, I do want to introduce month-oriented arithmetic and year-oriented arithmetic on the year-month weekday last uh, year-month weekday class. And to do that, I need to introduce one more type to you, and that's called weekday last. Some months have four weekdays. Some months have five weekdays. It depends on which weekday we're talking about. If you just want to talk about the last weekday of a month, you take that constant last that we used for last day of the month, reuse it, index your weekday, and you've got an object of type weekday last that represents the last day of the month. Just another little building block, and it's all going to come together in the next slide. So let's go back to month and year oriented arithmetic. Here I've got an example. I've got the fifth Friday of November 2019, and I want to add a year to it. Now, there's nothing special about years. I could have just as easily added 12 months to this. It'd be the exact same problem. So if you check your calendars real quick, you'll note that, yes, this month does indeed have five Fridays. So fifth Friday of November 2019 is a valid date. Let's add the years to it, and all that's going to do is increment the months and the years field, and we're going to come up with the fifth Friday of November 2020. Does November 2020 have five Fridays? Who knows? We can ask, is it a valid date? No, it's, it's not a valid date, it turns out. So we can fall back to the same pattern that we used with year, month, day. We can snap to the end of the month, or we can overflow into December. And the way you snap to the end of the month is you extract the year, month, and weekday and just index that weekday with last. And this forms a year, month, weekday, last type whose name doesn't appear here, thanks to the conventional syntax. And then convert that to sysdays, bounce it off sysdays, bring it back, and you've uh, converted back to a year-month weekday class. So this is how you would uh, snap to the end of the month 
using nth weekday of the month, year and month arithmetic. Or you might want to overflow into December, say, okay, uh, it doesn't have five Fridays, let's land on the first Friday in December. It's even easier. You just directly convert it to cis days. Every cis days is valid, and then you bounce it back out to your year, month, weekday, and now you've got the first Friday of December 2020. Same pattern as with uh, year, month, day. That wraps up the calendrical types. Now let's get into time zones. Um, the first thing to recognize about time zones is that system clock and the whole SysTime family of time points are Unix time. What's Unix time? Don't panic, it's what your computer has been using since 1970 or so. It's what POSIX uses, it's what Windows uses, it's what uh, BSD and Mac OS and Android, it's what everybody uses. And it is uh, time measured since New Year's 1970, excluding leap seconds. And I mention excluding leap seconds not because it's a big deal. You've been excluding leap seconds probably every time you've dealt with date and time and may not have realized it. And it doesn't mean that C++20 can't handle leap seconds. It can. It just means that system clock can't handle leap seconds because that's the standard practice. So C++20 adds a time zone class, which is used to transform sys time into local time. Now C only has the concept of two time zones. Whatever time zone your computer happens to be set to for its local time zone, and UTC. C++20 has these two concepts, but it expands it to all IANA time zones. We're using the IANA time zone database as a portable, device, a portable database across all platforms. Now, if you don't know what this database is, that's okay. It's the one that your Mac OS and your uh, Linux and your BSD systems and your Android systems are already using today. It's not the time zone database that Windows is using, but they've agreed to this specification. So in the future, at least when you're inside of Chrono, it will be the time zone database that Windows is using. And that means that when you construct, when you use a time zone name in your code, it's portable. It's not like locales where you've got to switch names every time you port your code around. The, the time zone name for right here is Europe slash Berlin. And that will be true across every single platform in C++20. So let me throw out a, a few examples. I'm an example person. I learn best by examples, and hopefully you guys are too. Otherwise, well, um, you've already seen this. You know how to get the time in UTC. You just call system clock now. And I told you at the beginning of the, of the talk that every single thing I talk about is streamable. So if you streamed out TP, this is what you'd see, maybe with a slightly different value. I, 11, four, yeah, I'm a little, I'm running a little fast here, I guess. I thought it would be, oh, no, I'm running a little fast. That's because this is UTC time, not Berlin time. So it, it streams out date in ISO format, hours, minutes, seconds. Notice you get fractional seconds here. You get fractional seconds, and it's not always six. You'll get however many fractional seconds it takes to exactly represent whatever value is in your system clock time point. On my platform, system clock time point is counting microseconds, thus the six fractional digits. Your platform may, for example, represent system clock time point in nanoseconds. And in that case, if you did this experiment, you'll get nine decimal digits. If you want to transform this to local time, you start the same way. You call system clock now. Then you call a function called current zone. Current zone, ask your operating system what time zone is the computer using for its, for its local time zone. And it returns a pointer to that, to that time zone. It's not a pointer you have to ma uh, manage. It's there in the implementation as a const object, and you can't uh, modify it. You can only get a pointer to it. It's a lot like uh, getting a, a reference to a, a type info from a type ID expression. Now we've got a pointer to a time zone, and we've got an instant in time, and there's a class called zone time 
that does nothing but pair those two together and make them convenient to, to operate with. So you form a zone time out of this, these two objects, and when you stream it out, you get the local time for that time zone. Um, for example, now we're, we're one hour later than, uh, than the previous uh, example, because I'm assuming that the current zone is Europe Berlin, whose time zone abbreviation is Central European Time. And so it does the computation for you under the hood. You don't have to worry about, do I add the UTC offset or subtract it? That would be, you know, that's the sort of error-prone thing uh, that one can do with, uh, and of course, Chrono doesn't want to make you, uh, doesn't want to give you the, the opportunity to make errors, and so it does this for you. Now, Chrono is also written in several API layers, and we're looking at only the highest level layer here. So if you want to get the UTC offset and add and subtract it to your system, you can do that. There's an API for that. I won't be presenting that, uh, that AP, lower level API today just because of limited time. Um, let's say that we wanted to find out what time it was in, in Berlin, but without setting our computer to the, our, our computer's current local time zone to Berlin. Because after all, changing your computer's current local time zone is a lot like changing a global. It's not thread safe. So instead of calling current zone, it's the exact same syntax, except I just put your Berlin in, str in string form. It can actually be a string view. And I get the exact same type, zone time, and I get the exact same value under the hood. So you can either work with current zone or you can work with named time zones. So let's look in more detail about what zone time is. It's actually a templated class. On the previous slide, I didn't show the template arguments. They were deduced by constructor template argument deduction. I think CTAD, I think I got that acronym right. It's a C++ 17 language feature. You could ex uh, explicitly add the template arguments if you like. The first template argument is just a, a duration. Time zone, uh, zone times can be any precision you want as long as their seconds are finer. The reason they have to be at least as fine as seconds is because the UTC offsets in the IA in a time zone database have precision seconds. And so to make the transformation between uh, system time and local time, you're going to have to be at least as fine as seconds precision. And the second thing is the time zone pointer, the second template argument. The reason for this is I want you to be able to write your own time zones. Um, the reason I want you to be able to write your own time zones is not everything, not every use case is handled by the IANA database. Almost all are, and I expect very few people will want to write their own time zones. But the IANA database might be too heavy for your embedded application, and I don't want to exclude you from using all the wonderful C++ 20 chrono things if your, your operating environment doesn't allow for something as heavyweight as a database. For example, maybe POSIX time zones are good enough for you. POSIX time zones are just formed by a string which contains the UTC offset and rules for going on and off uh, daylight savings time. So the, the data is literally one short string and you can make up any ones you want within the format that POSIX allows and call that a time zone. And on my website, I've actually done a proof of concept of this idea and if you want a POSIX time zone, just take the open source code off my website, uh, MIT license. You know, Knock yourself out. And it, you can install such a thing right into a zone time and immediately interoperate with all the rest of Chrono, the, uh, the local time, the, the sys time, and uh, the clocks that I haven't introduced yet. It all becomes immediately interoperable. You could even interoperate with the IA in a database as long as your system is supporting that. Um, so you could have both two types of time zones in the same application. So zone time is typically constructed with two arguments. I encourage you not to look at the, uh, the header synopsis or the header declarations for this because it's all quite complicated. But if you just think about it like this, 
It's usually constructed from just the two arguments, and somehow the first argument is going to specify a time zone, and the second argument is going to specify an instant in time. You use different things to specify each of those things. A time zone can be represented by a string view or by a pointer to a time zone. And an instant in time can be represented by a sys time, a local time, or another zone time. Now, I've started to use a term here, local time, uh, that I haven't quite introduced. And the problem is I've got so many things to introduce that there is not a great order to introduce everything. So in a few slides, I'll tell you what local time is in detail. But for now, just assume it's some way of specifying local time in a, in a time zone. Uh, so example time. Um, if I construct, here's constructing a zone time from a time zone constant pointer and assist time. And we've already seen this, and this is what it, what it prints out. And I can change just the first argument from a pointer to a string view. And now I've got the exact same thing that, that prints out. It has the same value that has the same printout. Now let's look at a changing uh, using a different type of time point. Here's an example of using local time. And I'm going to take a year month day, which happens to be today, tell the operating system that this year month day represents local time. And if there's, if there's no further modifications made to this local time, then, it, then it's pointing to the beginning of the day, the midnight where this day starts. And so when you print this out, you get exactly what you put in. It's kind of the identity operation, if you will. But it's a very useful thing nonetheless. If I do nothing but change local days to sys days, now I'm specifying not the local midnight here, but I'm saying this represents the UTC midnight. But give me the time in Berlin. And so that's one hour later. And if I want to specify a, a time of day, well, this is chrono. This is actually almost just going back to C++11 stuff. Local days is a time, time point. Got a slide on that in a little, little bit. And you can add any duration you want to that time point. Here I'm adding an hour. You can add minutes. You can add nanoseconds, whatever you want. And it's reflected back as the identity operation, since I'm using local days, in the output when I stream this thing out. And finally, there's a third way that's probably the most useful. And again, we're at the Lego block level. I'll show you later how this fits into a nice, neat, non-intuitive application. Um, in this example, I'm using a zone time to specify the time point for another zone time. So I've got 1 o'clock in Berlin. And I use that zone time to specify the zone time for another zone time that is in New York. And I know that may have been confusing the way it sounded. It certainly confused me. But hopefully the code is clear. I'm actually much better at speaking C++ than I am English. Sorry about that. Um, what this does under the hood is line up the two UTC time points so that in each of those, these two zone times, you have the exact same value for the UTC time point. So if you're at 1 o'clock in Berlin, the equivalent time in New York at that same instance is 1,900 hours the previous day, which can be very handy when trying to, find, when trying to set up meetings, international meetings. So local time is not mysterious. I want to just take the covers off that tell you exactly what it is so you're not worried about this mysterious thing wandering around. It's just another chrono time point. But it's not based on system clock. It's based on a clock called local T. And right now today is probably the first and last time you will ever hear about local T because most of the time you can just ignore that it exists because it's not really a clock. It has no now function. There's a good reason it doesn't have a now function. And that is to prevent runtime errors. Uh, if you had a, a now function on your local time, exactly what would it return? Because local time is a time that uh, is not yet paired with a time zone. It's not really an instant in time yet. It's a time point that you might pair with a time, point, with a, uh, time zone later. 
So if it had a now function, and let's pretend for a minute that it had a now function. If you took a local time and tried to sleep on it with a, a standard this thread sleep until, it turns out that sleep until under the hood calls the time points clocks now function in order to figure out whether it, it can return yet or not. And if local time had a now function, say that through an exception or whatever, if you accidentally slept until a local time, that would be a runtime error. Since it doesn't have a, a now function, if you use it to call sleep until, compile time error. Compile time error is good, runtime error is bad. Uh, <clears throat> so it will only, the local time will only be become a true instant in time when it's paired with a time zone, for example, using a zone time constructor. And local days is just a, a type alias for local time with a precision of days, just like sys days is a type alias for sys time with a precision of days. Same pattern used over and over again. And finally, calendars have to convert back and forth between local time, just as they do with sys days, but they use the exact same math in doing so. For example, let's say I had a, uh, a year month day pointing to today, and I convert that to sys days. Under the hood, that sys days is going to contain 18,214. That happens to be how many days we are after the 1970 New Year's. Using local days, I get the exact same value. The only difference between local days and sys days is that they have subtly different meanings. Sys days means a UTC time point. You can nail down exactly when it is. Local days is like talking, like, uh, talking about a holiday. We're going to have a party on New Year's at midnight. Where? Everywhere. The whole planet is. But it doesn't happen at exactly the, whole, at, at exactly the same time around the planet. So local, if you want to talk about a holiday that's not nailed down to a particular location or time zone, that's exactly what local days is. It has those exact, exact semantics. So examples. Oh, not an example, actually. Zone time is a, by itself a fairly simple class. It's not doing that much under the hood. It is storing a pointer to a time zone and it's storing a sys time and it can, can compute for you the local time. And it has getters for the sys time and getters for the lo local time. You can even get a getter for the, for the time zone. And the, uh, the main point here is that both sys time and local time are important and they're both available to you and they're different types so that if you try to subtract a sys time and a local time, Compile time error. If it, if it weren't a compile time error, it would be a runtime error because you would get garbage out. And finally, I want to get away from the low level Lego view building blocks of this and talk about a program that I actually wrote and was actually useful. Um, I'm in a, I, I have a meeting uh, every other Wednesday for the entire year 2019. And we always meet at 1,800 hours according to London time. The reason for that is one of our guys happens to, to live in London, and that's when it's convenient for him. And everybody else around the globe just adjust. And I live in New York, so I need to find out what time I'm meeting, what date, and what time throughout the year. So here's the program. Uh, this is, you know, except for headers and using declarations, this is the complete program. Uh, you start with a, a beginning date, uh, in this case uh, using a year month day object, January 9th, 2019. I want to loop until it's year 2020 because I want to cover all of 2019. And I'm going to increment this date by two weeks on every iteration. Now to do that, weeks is basically day oriented arithmetic because it's just 14 days. So I convert to sys days and then convert back to year month day on every iteration. And the first thing I do in this loop is I take the, the year month day, convert it to local days and add 18 hours to specify 1800 hours local time and pair that with, with London so, and print that out. So this should print out 1800 hours using the uh, London time zone 
and uh, whatever date happens to be for this iteration of, of the loop. Now I want to find out what time is it in New York at that same instant. And that's as simple as constructing my zone time with the, with the London zone time and pointing the zone time at the New York time zone. And so it, it prints out this. And as you might have surmised, we get 1,800 hours on the first date, GMT. And you may already know that New York is always five hours behind London. And so, of course, we get 1,300 hours EST. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, this seems like an awfully over-engineered way to program subtraction by five hours. <laughs> and I couldn't blame you for that. But we have this meeting in March. And my, my New York time shifts from 1,300 hours to 1,400 hours. What's going on here? This is why it's not an over-engineered way to subtract five hours. I forgot. It turns out that the politicians decided that uh, London goes off, goes on to daylight savings time. Yes, that's correct. At different time than New York does. And so for a brief time period, period of the year, New York and London are only four hours apart. And you don't have to worry about that up here in this high-level code. All you have to worry about is what your time zones are and when you want your meeting to be. Does this happen again in the fall? Does anybody know? And if so, would it be a four-hour difference or would it be a six-hour difference? Anybody want to guess? Six. Very good. Uh, who thinks it's a six-hour difference? A few hands. Who thinks it's a four-hour difference? Who thinks it, it's the same? A lot of people don't know, myself included. So we run this through, and lo and behold, here in October 30th, it's four hours again. And I'm glad I didn't have to figure, out that, figure that out by hand because I know I would have gotten it wrong. So yes, this is an over-engineered way to subtract five hours or four hours, or six hours, we don't really know, and that's why it's engineered this way. So moving on to formatting. Um, even though everything has a streaming operator, it may not be streamed in exactly the way you would like it to be streamed. And C++20 has an answer for that. And it's actually not part of Chrono. There's a library that's been implemented on GitHub for the past several years called uh, FMT. And that is being standardized in C++20, and it will be in namespace standard, not namespace standard chrono. And chrono C++20 has been fully integrated into that library so that you can use it uh, just as if we had planned it that way all along. Uh, and it will bring with it all of the um, formatting flags that you're familiar with or you may or may not be familiar with from strift time and from put time from C++11. So example time. Um, here is the default formatting uh, that I've already shown you when you stream things. If you want to get this exact same format using standard format, you just include this formatting string. Percent %F stands for the date. Percent %T stands for the hour, minute, seconds field, including fractional seconds. And percent cap %Z stands for the time zone abbreviation. So that's great. You know, we, we didn't really need format for this because it already happens by default. If you wanted to, say, uh, output something in a d.m.y format, this is how you'd do it. You would change your formatting string and, uh, to percent %d, percent %m, percent %y. And just to show that I could, I'm no longer printing out the time zone abbreviation. Instead, I'm printing out the UTC offset with lowercase percent %z. Actually, only, only the Z is lowercase there. The percent is uppercase. Um, and if you're not happy with the decimal point operator, and if your operating system supports it, you can insert a locale as the first, ob the first item in your format statement, and it'll control things such as uh, the names of your months and weekdays and what decimal point, what characters used for the decimal point, and so forth and so on. 
And if you're not happy with the precision, the way to control that is on your input. You truncate your, your time point input to whatever precision it is that you want printed out. For example, if you want three decimal digits printed out, you truncate to milliseconds. Um, once you get down to truncating to seconds, the decimal point uh, goes ahead and just disappears. And, uh, and that's all there is to it. And be assured that you can, you can format not only uh, system clock time points, sys times, you can format all of these types in the Chrono library. And there'll be a test at the end of the talk to make sure that you remember all these, talk, these types. Uh, no, I, actually, I'm just trying to emphasize that if you've got it and it's in Chrono, it's formatable. And anything you can format out, you can parse in using the exact same format string. Uh, so here's an example where I've got a, a system clock time, po time point, and I want to parse it in using the day.m.y ordering and um, the time, including fractional seconds, and the UTC offset. Now this is an interesting example for, for another reason, not just showing the parsing ability, but the parser is smart enough to know, okay, I'm parsing in assist time. Assist time is a UTC time, and I've also got a UTC offset. So it parses in this time, considers it a local time, transforms it using the UTC offset, and you see the output is one hour offset from the input. I could have also just as easily parsed in a local time instead of a sys time. And in that case, it would have parsed that, that UTC offset. It still has to be there. But it would not apply it to the value, and you'd get basically the identity operation. So the parser is fairly smart in that way. So. Rewinding a little bit back to C++11. C++11 introduced system clock, steady clock, and high resolution clock. And each of these clocks is, represents an entire family of time points. And arithmetic, arithmetic within one family of time points is allowed. And arithmetic outside the family is, is not allowed. And the difference between all these clocks is system clock measures the time of day. There's a direct relationship between system clock and the civil calendar. Steady clock has no relationship whatsoever to the, to the civil calendar. It's like a stopwatch. You can start and stop it. It's good for timing. It's not good for telling the time of the day. High resolution clock is typically a type alias to either steady clock or system clock. And depending on which platform you're using, it could be either one. So I don't really recommend high resolution clock. Um, Decide whether you need steady clock or system clock and just choose one of those instead of choosing high resolution clock and have your application subtle, very subtly change behavior when you port it to some other application, some other platform. Um, everybody makes mistakes and high resolution clock is one of mine. So you just have to fess up to them and, and move on. Uh, C++ 20 adds four new clocks, file clock, UTC clock, GPS clock, and TAI clock, and I've got a brief slide on each one of these. And the first one I'd like to talk about is file clock. File clock actually exists in C++17. It is the clock that is under the hood of file system that file, t file time type relates to. And a lot of people are, are kind of frustrated that this clock is exceedingly hard to, to use, for one, it, it doesn't even have a name in C++17. We give it a name. It's going to be called file clock in C++20. And furthermore, there's a new function being introduced called clock cast, where you can take one family of time points and convert it to another family of time points. So clock cast can be used to convert system clock, or sys times, to and from file time. So if you've got a system time and you want to use it in the file, time, file system library, now you can. You just clock cast it to file clock. Now it's a file time with whatever precision you were using in, in SysTime, and then you can use it in your file system's API. I know uh, I've been told that that's like the number one bug report that, that vendors have these days is how to convert between these two. And the answer is upgrade to C++ 20. 
Well, first the upgrade is get the vendors to implement everything, and then upgrade to C++20. So UTC time. UTC time is just like sys time, except remember when I said sys time excluded the leap seconds in the count? UTC time includes the count of leap seconds. Otherwise, it's no different. And this doesn't turn your computer into a super accurate machine during leap second insertions, uh, unless perhaps your computer happens to be hooked up to an atomic clock. What it does do is if you've got two time points that straddle a leap second insertion point, and you want to subtract those, and you actually need the precision of, of one second or less between these two time points, it's going to give you the right answer. Where if you try that experiment with system clock, it's not counting that leap second in the middle, and so your, your result is one second less. There's very few applications that, that need this, but those that need it really need it bad. And that's why UTC clock is, is offered in C++20. Of course, you can format it and parse it. And when you do, if you happen to have a time point that's during a leap second insertion, you will get the, the 60 in the seconds field. And you can parse such a thing back out. Uh, if, your time point, if you're parsing a time point during a, a leap second insertion, it will parse the 60 in the seconds field. If you have a 60 in the seconds field and you're not parsing a time point during a leap second insertion, that'll actually be a, a failure and the stream will set fail bit. Um, GPS clock. The first thing to know about GPS clock is it does not turn your computer into a GPS receiver. So don't, don't try. What it does do is it models the GPS time standard, which counts time since the first Sunday in January of 1980, midnight UTC. And it counts leap seconds, but in a different way than UTC clock. Instead of having some minutes that have 60 se uh, 61 seconds, every time there's a leap second, the minute has 60 seconds, but the mapping to the civil calendar gets ahead by one second more. Which can be very confusing if you've got a, uh, a date time and somebody tells you, well, by the way, this is in the GPS map civil time. You can use ClockCast to take that and map it from GPS clock to system clock or to UTC clock and get that calendar shifted back the way you, you think it ought to be. Now, a lot, of t a lot of modern GPS receivers actually give you UTC time, so you may not have to use this, but if you do have to use this, it's in your toolbox. Uh, TAI, TAI clock. TAI is the first atomic uh, standard that humanity had. It started in 1958, uh, January 1st, 1958. It's offset, at that time, it was offset 10 seconds from UTC. That's not really said right because at that time UTC didn't exist. By 1972, TAI and UTC were offset from each other by 10 seconds and that's modeled here. And it handles leap seconds the same way that GPS clock does. All its minutes are 60 seconds. And every time we have a leap second, it shifts another second forward in time. So if you get a TAI time point, uh, you can handle it with TAI clock and TAI time. And of course, it participates in the clock cast system so that you can uh, convert your TAI time to any of the other clocks directly. Now I want to uh, talk just a little bit more about this clock cast system. User-written clocks can also participate in the clock cast system, and it's remarkably easy to do so. All you have to do is write a bidirectional conversion uh, function, both to SysTime or from SysTime. Or, if that's not appropriate, you can write one pair of bidirectional conversions to UTC time and back from UTC time. After you do that, your user-written clock can clock cast to every other clock that supports clock cast. All of the standard supplied ones, some uh, other user supplied clocks, it's very easy to support clock cast with your uh, user supplied clock. So I'm going to wrap up here with a, a few general comments. Library design is an engineering process and it's, it's both an art and a science. There's hardly ever one right answer. And when, you, when there is, you know, of course, take, 
take the one right answer, but usually there's conflicting trade-offs where, you know, if you make a decision a little bit one way, you favor one goal, but you, you realize that you're disfavoring another goal, and the good engineer is the one that can decide exactly where to make the trade-offs among conflicting goals. And it's an iterative process. You're never going to get the, uh, the best answer the first time. The, the first car wasn't a fancy Ferrari. It was a tricycle with a motor on it. And it took many, many iterations over many, many years for the technology to develop from one to the other. So it goes with software. And I believe we're still in the early phases of maturing in the uh, software industry. So I want to encourage you to study others' code and learn from past successes, and even more importantly, learn from past failures. I believe we can learn even more from the failures than we can from the successes. And I've tried to detect, uh, tried to emphasize some of the things I've used in the Chrono Library, and I hope you can take those ideas to your own library. Detect as many errors as you can at compile time, and make client code as readable as possible, and eliminate any ambiguities in your client code. If, if you can imagine what your client's writing and you see that, wow, that could be interpreted several different ways, rewrite your API so that your client can't do that. And encourage your client, your client to write efficient code. If you're the author of list, don't put an indexing operator on it. That would just be encouraging your, your client to write order in squared loops. And if you can, offer both low-level and high-level access. Mainly what I've shown you today is just the high-level access. I haven't had time to go through all the low-level APIs. But the low-level APIs would emphasize uncompromising performance and maximal flexibility, whereas your high-level API is about offering uh, perhaps more type safety or more convenience for them only for the most uh, common cases. And finally, if there's only one thing that you take away from this talk, it's the readability of the code of your clients is far more important than the readability of your own code, even your own synopsis. Uh, when I was first in introduced Chrono in, in C++11, a lot of people, in fact, this still happens today, a lot of people you know, don't know a lot about Chrono, and the first way you learn about a library is you go look at the header, see what it does. Well, the Chrono header is really ugly. It's full of templates and all kinds of operators. It's large and does some really ugly things. But once you learn how to use Chrono properly, um, and if, you're, if you are using it properly, the code is usually very neat on the, uh, the client side. So that's not to say that your header should be ugly. Please, you know, don't make that a goal. All I'm saying is that if you have to sacrifice the, the prettiness of your own code to make your client's code prettier, choose to make your client's code prettier. That wraps up my talk. Thank you for your time, and I'm open to questions. So my name is Michael from um, south of Germany. Thank you, Howard, a lot of the talk. I enjoyed it a lot. I have a question regarding the index operator on the, um, on the day, so Thursday, square angle bracket two. I was surprised for this to be the second Thursday. For me, that's read like the third Thursday. Ah. Uh, can you explain the rationale behind it, why you did that? And also, what happens with Thursday index zero? So that's a good question. Thank you. I, honestly, the answer is uh, I did what was most natural in my own culture, so sorry about that. Uh, and to answer the, the, first, the second part of your question, what does Thursday zero mean, that actually has a good meaning. It's the Thursday before the first Thursday of the month. So it will be the last Thursday of the previous month. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Howard. Uh, great talk. Thank you a lot. Thanks a Thank lot. You. And you, you made it seem straightforward to me anyway. And anyone who's ever worked with calendars knows that that's a very difficult thing. One um, down, a million to go. Okay. <laughs> well, 
Um, uh, my question is, uh, you showed how to make a date representation by increasing the granularity, leaving off like seconds and the time basically. Um, is there also something or what would be your advice to do the opposite? Like for example, if you want to store someone's birth date, but you don't want to be rude and ask them for their age, so you just want to store the month and the day, or also something like uh, three o'clock each day or something like that. So what would be the advice for leaving off yeah, the higher, uh, the so higher uh, bits? Uh, one <coughs> of the types that I did not specifically introduce today is called month day. And it's specifically okay, yep. for that purpose. So you can yep. you know, put in May 3rd and it means May 3rd of some unspecified year. As for time of day, there's a, uh, I would just store a duration of time since midnight. There's also yeah. a class in there called HHMMSS, which stores a time duration in hours, minutes, seconds, and subseconds field. But I view that mainly as a formatting aid as opposed to a good storage device, because all it does is it takes a duration and it breaks it into the fields. Uh, so my advice is to store three o'clock as 15 hours. Okay, thanks a lot. Or three hours, depending on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Harald. I'm Matthias von Steinka from Cologne. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was really great. Thank you. Um, I have a question actually about this year, month, day um, stuff. So when it's understood correctly, when you add um, one month to the November or October 31st, you get December the 1st, right? You Actually, you can if you do the extra computation. What you get is November 31st. November and, 31st. And then if you're not happy with it, which I imagine you would not be, okay. you would I'm need to either overflow it into December, as I, as I showed on one of the slides, or snap it back to November 30th. Okay, because my question is, how do you handle actually uh, leap years? So when you add one year to today of today, do you actually also get uh, November the 14th or do you get November the 13th, 2020? Because next year is leap year, so what do you get then? You, you get November 14th of 2020. Okay. And <clears throat> I want to uh, emphasize though, that's only when you add a year to a calendrical type such as year, month, day. Um, I didn't get into adding years to uh, chronological types such as system clock time point because I didn't want to send everybody over the edge. I'll save that detail for another talk. But there's a difference between chronological uh, operations or chronological arithmetic and calendrical arithmetic. And calendrical arithmetic is what we use when we're operating on uh, calendrical types such as year, month, day. Mm -hmm. And all calendrical arithmetic on year, month, day will only modify the months field and the years field and the day field is completely ignored and completely stable. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Howard. That was a brilliant talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that we could subtract months. So I was curious to know what would happen if you subtract a month that's smaller uh, to a month that's bigger. Say, for example, January minus December, what will come out? Let's see, January minus December will give you one month. And December minus January will give you 11 months. Fair enough. And also, where would you recommend to go to read more about the proper usage of chrono if we don't read the headers? <laughs> uh, I guess my, my first recommendation, at least for pre-C++20 stuff, would be uh, Nico Giacetti's excellent book. He has a very good section in there on C++11 chrono. For the newer stuff, we're still lacking, but I have a complete implementation of this on my uh, GitHub library. If you just search for Howard Hennett date, you'll stumble across it. And in that uh, repository, there is documentation on the date stuff and the time zone stuff. And um, there's uh, a FAC and example usages comparing it to doing the same thing in boost date time. And if that still doesn't work, uh, you can open an issue and just ask me a question. You can also just post to Stack Overflow and put Chrono in the, in the header, and I will magically appear. It just happens. <laughs> uh, 
So feel free to ask questions either online or email me privately is fine too. Uh, my email address is easy to find. Uh, so I get lots of spam, but you know, I won't put you in the spam bucket. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Hello, Howard. Uh, thanks a lot for your great talk and your work with the Chrono library. I think it's really an example of how elegant and beautiful C++ can be. Uh, now, you've mentioned a lot about uh, user-defined types and uh, compile errors. I have actually tried to implement my own uh, or define my own clock type. And I had to give up because of uh, how <laughs> ugly C++ can be because the compiler didn't uh, tell me what was, what was wrong with my, with my custom clock. Um, now that you mentioned a lot about user-defined types and compile times, you haven't mentioned concepts. So I guess my question is, is this something that will become easier in C++20 when you will actually be, the compiler can actually give you uh, useful error messages? Uh, not with respect to C++20 and Chrono. Uh, Chrono has not been conceptified. That could happen in C++23. Um, we're still in the final stages of uh, creating C++20, and some of us are thinking that far ahead, and others are not, and I have not given uh, that particular question any thought at all, so I don't know about 23. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm Adam from Poland. Um, so regarding the year, month, day uh, class, I wanted to ask if it's easy to switch, not to iterate over months, but rather than weeks of the year. So let's say I'd like to have a, a date that represents a Wednesday of 23rd week of the year. Oh, using the ISO definition of, of weeks? Uh, yes. Okay, good. So assuming you have more or less tw uh, 52 weeks of year. Exactly. Excellent question. Um, it's, it's not easy as in out of the box. However, the ISO week-based year is a separate calendar system that, that the user could write himself. And as long as it converts to and from sys days, then that calendar interoperates with every other calendar. Now, if you don't want to write it yourself, I don't blame you, but it won't be in C++20. But in the same GitHub repository that has this example library, there's a single header with no source file called ISO week calendar or something like that. And it's already done for you there. Uh, please feel free to use it. Okay. MIT open source license. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Hi, I'm Max from Thinkcell in Berlin. And I just wanted to just first of all say thank you. Thank you. Um, but my question is about the semantics of zone times in the future beyond where we know the time zone definitions. For example, here in Berlin, in the Europe Berlin time zone, we don't know what the time zone definition is going to be 12 months from today, although we can be fairly certain of what's going to be 11 months from today. Um, so if I create a zone time for 14th of November, 1130 of 2020, is that going to be the time according to the current definition, or is it going to be the time that is 1130 according to the definition in force then? when I look at this zone time again? It depends entirely on your politicians, which basically <laughs> means you're screwed, but um, the, the database does look forward in that the, the rules for time zones are stuff like, you know, you, you change the first Monday in March or whatever it is at some particular time. And rules like that can be applied forward in time, and the database does do that, and this program subsequently does do that with the caveat that at any point in time, for any reason, like they're about to lose a vote, politicians can change the rules of when daylight savings time goes on and off. And at that point, INA uh, will issue a new database. The databases are versioned. And you can get the version number of each database out of this software. Um, and that database will need to propagate first to your vendor, and then your vendor will need to ship it, and then your program will react to that new information. Thank you. Excellent talk, thank you. Could you please elaborate why do you consider a high, uh, this high definition clock from C++11 a mistake? Uh, um, the, when, I, when I wrote high resolution, when, it, when I introduced high resolution clock, I thought that there might be a specific clock offered by an operating system that would have higher resolution than any other clock and yet not be system clock or steady clock. 
And in practice, that turns out to be not true. Uh, in practice, steady clock is usually the highest resolution clock. Um, although on Linux, uh, both system clock and steady clock have the same resolution. And so in hindsight, uh, high resolution clock is just an obfuscated way of saying either system clock or steady clock, and you don't know which unless you nail it down to a single platform. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much.